Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman. Week two, almost in the books. And we hope you survived. I did it. How are you, Jim? Neither did I. So we are on to week three, Greg, and it should be an interesting one because not only do we have all these injuries to guys like Christian McCaffrey, guys like Saquon Barkley, maybe Michael Thomas is still dinged up, you know, Devontae Adams, we don't know his status yet. Not only is it that, but we also had a lot of role changes in week number week number two. Guys seeing increased workloads from where they were at in week number one, uh, solidifying roles they may have had in week one, too. So it's not just the injuries that are at play here for week number three. It's also guys with role changes, and those, th those may go overlooked with all the focus being on the injuries. I think it's a great point. With so many injuries taking place uh, during week two, we may not realize some of the guys that some of the guys that really stepped up and took over their backfields. And that's why we want to begin in Washington, where we chatted a lot about Antonio Gibson before the season began, especially when Darius Geis was released and then Adrian Peterson. And after week one, well, predictably, it was the Peyton Barber show. What wasn't so predictable was that the Peyton Barber show would end with week two. Antonio Gibson stepped up, and right now, he's the guy you want to own in Washington. Very much so, because his role in week number two was wildly different than what it was in week number one. Antonio Gibson played 65% of the snaps in week number two. He had 13 carries and two targets. And you could look at the way this game played out, see that Arizona got a big lead early and say, okay, it was just game script. You know, they used Peyton Barber when they're ahead. They used Gibson there behind. But that doesn't tell the entire story because, yes, that did influence Peyton Barber's role. But also we saw Antonio Gibson outsnap J.D. McKissick. And McKissick is kind of a, the bigger piece here to keep note of when it comes to this Washington backfield. Because if Antonio Gibson is going to be a fantasy relevant player in this backfield, he's got to dispose of McKissick. And McKissick's snap rate went down to 44% this week. It was around there last week, too. But seeing a lot of the snaps go to Gibson this time around, that's a good thing for Gibson. So... It was not just game script. His role did legitimately expand, and that is a good thing for him moving forward. Now, there are still a couple of notes here with Antonio Gibson and reasons why we should proceed with caution at the same time. Uh, McKissick did have the only run for the team inside the 10-yard line. So, you know, Peyton Barber is still going to be there. McKissick may get some goal line work, too. That's very much worth noting. And we also know this offense might not have leads all that often, which is great because we want Gibson for that game script, but it also means fewer touchdown chances for everyone tied to this offense. And that does negatively impact Gibson as well. So may not get the goal line work. Uh, they may not score a lot of touchdowns. Those are legitimate concerns with Antonio Gibson. However, we do see his role expanding. Uh, he could get more targets in the very near future if he starts to be more comfortable in that offense. So I think Gibson is someone whose stock is definitely on the rise. It's not a perfect situation yet, but it's a whole heck of a lot better than week one, and he's suddenly becoming a relevant piece we can potentially turn to in week number three. Reliability is what we're looking for, of course, from Antonio Gibson for Washington. And maybe he's not getting every snap, and maybe he won't get every carry, but Gibson's on the rise, and that trust level is, begin is beginning with Ron Rivera, who, as we've seen, of course, when you get a guy like Christian McCaffrey, you're just going to give everything to. Well, Gibson may not be McCaffrey, He's clearly the best that Washington has at the moment. So hopefully all of those numbers that you mentioned continues to rise as we enter week three. Nobody necessarily thought that James Robinson would be the guy in Jacksonville, but when Leonard Fournette was released, we'll get to in a moment, and Reichel Armstead went on the IR and a couple other guys weren't available, James Robinson became the guy. And we really mean that he's the guy right now, Jim. He's been dominating the touches. Forget whatever game script you want. Robinson's crushing it. Yeah, he is. And I think that num week number two was a key one for a couple of reasons. The first one is that they were trailing for most of that game. Robinson still played 51% of the snaps, 16 carries and four targets. So even in a negative script, he was still out there. That's a good thing for him. But also not just the role for Robinson. It was also the offense being competent because I view the Tennessee defense with all the pieces that they have as being a good defense. And Jacksonville still put up 30 on them. And they were in that game for the entire day. They were able to claw their way back. And that, to me, says that Gardner Minshew is leading a semi-efficient offense, which should keep them in games more often. That's what you want if you are someone who wants to use James Robinson in fantasy football. You need them to keep the game close. And I have more confidence now that they will do so than I did coming into the year. Doing Putting up 30 points in the Titans is more impressive to me than doing what they did last week against the Colts. So I think that's a major stock up. And it, it impacts everyone here. But I think that Robinson is the biggest benefactor because he is the early down back on this team. So 
I was skeptical initially here with Robinson just because, you know, Chris Thompson was there to take away some targets. It was not a good offense or an offense I didn't expect to be good at least. And we could eventually see Devano Zigbo and Ryquel Armstead come in the picture. But with the way that Robinson is performing, I kind of see no reason to really deviate from what they're doing right now. So I think that week two was better for Robinson than week one. Even though his snap rate did go down, it just told me he is more viable than just situations where we expect the Jaguars to win comfortably because that may not happen all that often. So the offense looking good, that's good for James Robinson. He's looking good too, which does not hurt. So I think that week two solidified James Robinson is someone we can definitely turn to in our fantasy lineups for hopefully the next couple of weeks. James Robinson's usage yesterday was incredibly encouraging. And those that took a shot on him at the very end of your drafts or you were desperate for a flex play yesterday given all the injuries – well, Robinson came through, and if he's going to be able to be someone that's always on the field and Jacksonville feels comfortable with him, well, the sky seems to be the limit, or as far as Gardner Mustache, Gardner, Gardner Mustache, Gardner Minshew will take them. All right, the reason that James Robinson got his opportunity was because of Leonard Fournette being cut. And you and I have spoken so much about Fournette over the past couple of weeks. We've laughed, we've cried, and now we're here mentioning him again because yesterday he broke out for Tampa Bay, and not surprisingly, it all came after a Ronald Jones fumble. That's what changed everything for Leonard Fournette. So the obvious question is, will it continue into week three? Who knows? It's Tampa Bay. Uh, Bruce Arians can change his mind at any given time, as we've seen 18,000 times the past couple of years. This is never a solid situation, but I think that Leonard Fournette is more talented back in this backfield, and he's kind of showing that uh, by what he's doing on the field. So Fournette, I would say I feel better about Leonard Fournette heading into week three than I felt about Ronald Jones heading into week two, and that is definitely impactful. That's the way I'm viewing things as of right now. After that fumble for Ronald Jones, Fournette had eight carries and four targets compared to three carries and two targets for Ronald Jones. So the thing, the, the scale is very much tipped towards Leonard Fournette. He had five total targets in the game. So Fournette is getting targets, and he's in an offense that should be pretty solid for this year, and that's kind of all you can ask for for a running back in fantasy. Will Ronald Jones still get carries? Sure, I'd fully expect him to be in there, but we know that Bruce Arians does not tolerate fumbles, does not tolerate mistakes, and that probably means that Fournette is going to have a bigger role in Week 3 than he had in Week Number 2. Now, from a DFS perspective, we don't really get a chance to buy in on Fournette at a low salary. His salary is already up to $6,400, and that is pretty high. And it's within shouting distance of guys like Jonathan Taylor, and I'd very much take Taylor over Leonard Fournette every freaking time. But Fournette is someone we can start to feel good about plugging in there. He is, I think, more definitively the 1A in this offense now, and that's a good thing because we do want our running backs in good offenses. We want them to get targets, and Fournette's checking those boxes right now, and there's potential for much more down the road. So Fournette, a good fantasy piece right now, but he could become an even better one if he continues to solidify himself ahead of Ronald Jones. Jim, as you said, in DFS, Leonard Fournette, a little bit higher than you'd expect. A guy like Jonathan Taylor is a bit more expensive. It's worth it to go off and, and pay for him. But let me throw this back at you here for a moment. If you're a Leonard Fournette owner, you are, I am, our producer is, everybody's watching this. Some, somehow we all own Leonard Fournette. If you're a Leonard Fournette owner, are you excited about him because you're going to put him in your lineup this week and going forward? Or you're excited about him because you think you could trade him right now? I've been trying to trade Leonard Fournette for, for a decade, Greg, and I have been unsuccessful in a lot of leagues. So I will take whatever I can get. I'm not super optimistic. People will buy in. So honestly, at this point, I'm okay just letting it ride and seeing what happens. But hey, the offers you receive for Fournette will be less laughable now than they were before. So that can't be a bad thing. But I've, I've learned not to get too optimistic about people being excited about Leonard Fournette. That's for sure. Never get too excited about Leonard Fournette. But the good news is the offers will be just a little bit better than they were at this time last week. That's going to do it for us here on the FanDuel Hurry. Jim, next time I talk to you, we're stacking for week number three. We, we were pretty good yesterday. Hopefully it'll continue next week. Russell Wilson, Tyler Lockett, or DK Metcalf, and log out. That's all you need, Greg. Mr. Unlimited feels, feels pretty easy when you, we can make that happen. For Jim Sonis, I'm Greg Sussman. Thank you so much for watching. Tomorrow, Tom Vecchio will join the program as we take a look at week number three in DFS. Have a great night. Enjoy Monday Night Football, and we'll see you back here tomorrow for another edition of the FanDuel Hurry Up.